In this video, we explain how to write the chemical potential for a real solution. All right, so all of the work that we have been doing until now uh, in writing chemical potentials uh, has allowed us to come up with these expressions for a variety of cases. When you have a gas, the chemical potential of the gas is equal to the chemical potential of the standard state plus a correction that tells you the deviation from the standard state. For an ideal solution, that is when both components satisfy Raoult's law in the entire range of concentrations, then we have the chemical potential is equal to the chemical potential when the liquid is pure, plus a correction from the fact that in a mixture is not going to be pure, and then for an ideal dilute solution, and that is when the solvent satisfies Raoult's law and the solute satisfies Henry's, laws, Henry's law, uh, the solvent uh, has that expression and the solute has these expressions which are very similar to what we have for an ideal solution except that this one is expressed in terms of more concentrations and it's going to be very useful later on. Now, uh, just to recap this uh, uh, last video on ideal dilute solutions, uh, we have here the diagram where we plot vapor pressures, uh, P as a function of molar concentrations, or sorry, mole fractions of A and B, and then we can just wrap this off by uh, uh, showing here what Raoult's law is and Henry's law is for A, Raoult's law is and Henry's law is for B, and then showing how uh, uh, the actual vapor pressures would look like. Okay, so for A, you satisfy Raoult's law at high concentrations, and then Henry's law at low concentrations, which will be like that, and for B would be exactly the same thing. Raoult's law at high concentrations, and then uh, deviation, and eventually you get to Henry's law at low concentrations. All right, so again, uh, in ideal dilute solutions, we can write uh, the chemical potential so we have, as we have written here uh, in this range, okay, from here to high concentrations of A, and in this case, from here to high concentrations of B. All right, what we don't have yet, though, is an expression for writing the chemical, chemical potential when we're not in any of these cases, for example, right here. Uh, so at this concentration 50-50, of A and B, uh, it turns out that A does not satisfy any of the rules, any of the laws, and neither does B. So the question is, well, how do we actually handle this? Well, uh, as you can see, uh, notice that the expressions for the chemical potentials are always very similar. Right? You have the chemical potential of the in uh, conditions that you're interested in is going to be equal to the chemical potential of a reference, plus a correction from the fact that the, the target uh, condition that you're interested in might be different from the reference. Okay, so uh, this is actually very useful because it, it turns out that when you're in this particular case, uh, you should expect the chemical potential to have a similar form. Okay, so uh, the way that we're actually going to write this chemical potential then uh, for a real solution now, okay, so we're now in the case of a real, for a real solution would be to actually take the same uh, as form for the chemical potentials that we had uh, in ideal solutions or ideal dilute, but then modify it slightly so that um, uh, we can we can handle these cases where you don't satisfy any of the laws, right? So the idea here would be to say, look, the chemical potential of J is going to be equal to the chemical potential of J when pure plus RT not so log, and then what we write right here will be equal to A sub J. Okay. All right, so notice that this is what we call activity, okay? Uh, so the first thing, the question is, well, what is activity? Activity is just an effective measure of concentration. Okay, notice that in this particular expression, when we're writing this, okay, what we're actually doing here is uh, taking the same form as this uh, expressions. Okay, so essentially what this would be is an effective concentration of the mole fraction, okay? Uh, and again, that's what we call activity. Right, a way to express activity is going to be like this. For this particular case, activity is going to be equal to the null fraction, okay, and then multiplied by a constant gamma, and this is what we call the activity coefficient. Okay, so from here, we can try to understand a little bit better what activity is. Look, if this gamma factor, this activity coefficient happens to be one, then it turns out that your activity is identical to the mole fraction, okay, and then you're actually having you're in these cases. Okay, what that means is that this activity coefficient measures how far away you are from ideality. If gamma is equal to one, then you're in ideal case. 
If gamma is greater than 1 or smaller than 1, then you are not in the ideal case, but the size of that gamma uh, will tell you how far away you are. Okay, so, so that's essentially what we are. And it turns out that this way to proceed using activities and activity coefficients is entirely general. Now you can apply this to uh, actually any expression that you want of the ones that we have seen in this uh, particular chapter. Okay, for example, if you have Raoult's law, and you like to see how Raoult's law plays in this concentration range, what you would do is the following. You would say that, well, the pressure of my component J would be equal to uh, the activity of my component J times uh, the pressure of J when pure. Okay, that would be Raoult's law, but now expressed in terms of activity, which again you, you can rewrite as P sub J is equal to gamma times the mole fraction of J, P sub J star. Okay, so again, this will be Raoult's law in which the only difference is this activity coefficient gamma, okay, which tells you how far away you are from the ideal case. If you're in the ideal case, that gamma is 1. If you're in the real case, like you would be out here, that gamma may be 1.05 or 1.1 or maybe 0 0.85 or 0 0.9, so forth. Again, that's a measure of deviation from my ideality. Okay, so taking here from this uh, experiment right here, what we actually can do is then write an expression uh, for the chemical potential that is going to satisfy all of these cases. Okay, so uh, let's see if we can actually come up with a universal expression for how to write the chemical potential in any case, and then we'll see what happens when we can reduce it to a particular case. Okay, so what we're actually going to be using here is say that the chemical potential of uh, uh, any substance J, uh, and it doesn't matter what phase you're in, is going to be equal to the chemical potential of a reference, okay, plus RT, natural log of the activity, A sub J. All right, and again, now we can look at uh, how this uh, can get mapped into all of these cases. Okay, so for example, suppose that you're now uh, in the case of an ideal uh, a gas. Right, so for an ideal gas, then the idea would be here that your reference is going to be equal to uh, the standard state for pressure, which is one bar. Okay, this is one bar. And then your activity, A sub J, will be just the partial pressure of J when pure. Okay, divided over one bar. All right, so notice that you can use this expression and then do this mapping, and then you will recover uh, exactly the expression that we have for the chemical potential of an ideal gas. I, uh, let's try to go, for example, to an ideal dilute solution. I'll look at the solvent. Okay, so ideal dilute uh, solution, uh, and we'll look at the solvent. How we can use this expression then recover what we already have? Well, uh, what we then are going to do is say that the reference in this particular case is going to be uh, the pure liquid, okay? And then my activity, A sub J, is simply going to be equal to uh, x sub j, mod function. Okay, so this tells you the route to map this universal expression for the activity and any conditions, okay, into uh, the ideal dilute solution, the, the chemical potential for the solvent in an ideal dilute solution. What happens for an ideal dilute solution? You want to use the solute, and we actually want to use the solute in terms of molar concentration. Well, in that case, the reference, then, is going to be equal to uh, the standard uh, molar concentration, which is uh, equal to one molar. And then your activity is going to be equal to uh, the concentration of J molar divided by the reference concentration, which is the standard concentration, which is one molar. Okay, so again, you can see how uh, you can recover all of these expressions that you have right here if you're able to map what the reference state is for each one of them, and then uh, what the measure of concentration is. This also applies to the case uh, of a real uh, case, right? So in, in that case, well, uh, uh, you would just have to think about the reference and then the activity. Everything would be kind of exactly the same, but all of these activities would be multiplied by an activity coefficient gamma, which again might be different from one, okay? In the, in the future, uh, whenever we have to write the chemical potentials, we'll actually be using this expression. And then uh, we'll have to do the, the mapping for, uh, for our particular case. If we have a gas, then we'll have to recover this. If we have a solute in, an, uh, in a very dilute solution, then we'll have to use this. Uh, but you will see how it will be uh, pretty seamless uh, to be able to convert this into uh, expressions that we want that are all here 
again for uh, applied uh, examples like chemical equilibrium, osmotic pressure, uh, and freezing point elevation, boiling point, uh, uh, freezing point depression, boiling point elevation for mixtures of uh, liquids.